Well, hello everyone and welcome to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's first virtual public outreach event of 2021. We are very excited to have you all with us this evening for our microplastics problem sources and what you can do to help, help event with Lydia Johnson and Natasha Neves from Queen's University. We will be continuing to host these events in the upcoming months, so please stay tuned on Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website and social media. We also invite you to check out the recordings of our past events, which can be found on the official CUBE's YouTube channel. My name is Sabrina Razna, and I'm one of the outreach and teaching interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with Lindsay Ray, the other outreach and teaching intern, and Emily Verhook, the outreach and teaching coordinator, will be facilitating this event tonight. We are also thankful to have you all here with us tonight. And if you wish, please type your name and where you're Zooming in from into the chat box, as we would love to know if you are comfortable with sharing. We ask that you please keep your audio and video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box, which is the icon located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will be monitoring this chat box throughout the presentation and we'll have time for a Q&A. Please note that we will be recording this webinar and it will be available after this presentation on the CUBE's YouTube channel in case you need to leave early or wish to share it with your networks. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is a part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land, and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community, and there are First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Before we introduce our speakers, we want to just take a quick moment to get your feedback. A poll will pop up on your screen shortly. Would you please select the answers that relate to you? Excellent. So if people are just curious, we can show. Um, <clears throat> well, most of you heard about this through email or word of mouth, which is fantastic. We're always curious how people hear about our events. So this is great uh, feedback for us. And it's wonderful to see that so many of you that this is your first event. So that's also fantastic. For Lydia and Natasha, now you guys know some people have some basic, not most of you have some basic knowledge, um, but there's some that don't have much. So it's great. I'm sure everyone will learn something today. And most are adults. There's a couple of children joining, which is fantastic. I love to hear when um, we have the, the next generation of environmentalists joining on this. So that's fantastic. Thanks everyone for giving us some feedback. Now I'd like to take the time to introduce our two speakers for this evening. Lydia Johnson is a first year Master of Environmental Science student supervised by Dr. Diane Orahel in the QB3 research group. Lydia studied environmental science with biology at Lakehead University. Natasha Nees is in her first year of a master's degree in biology, supervised by Dr. Diane Orahel at Queen's University. Natasha graduated in biology, ecology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Lydia and Natasha will be elaborating more on their current research and how they became involved with microplastics, but we really appreciate them joining us tonight. Now I'll pass it along to you both. Great. Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Lydia Johnson and I will be presenting tonight with my lab mate, Natasha. Um, and we'll be presenting on microplastics, the problem, sources, and what you can do to help. So as we've mentioned a few times now, my name is Lydia. Um, I am in my first year of my master's of environmental studies um, at Queen's University in the QE3 lab 
which is supervised by Dr. Diane Orhel. My research looks to braid knowledge systems to study aquatic ecotoxicology. And I first became interested in microplastics a few years ago in my undergrad. I was studying at Pakasaw National Park um, for a field course. And as I was walking along the beach, I noticed microplastic pellets um, scattered along the shore. Um, at this point in my life, I thought that microplastics were an ocean problem and didn't affect me at all. Um, and then at this moment, I realized that it hit very close to home and they were affecting a lake that I grew up beside. Um, so since that moment, I've been super passionate about microplastics and do everything I can to, to sort of learn more. Um, I'll pass it over to Natasha. Thank you, Lydia. So hi, everyone. I'm Natasha. So I grew up in a coastal city here in Brazil. And even though we have like beautiful beaches, we also have a lot of plastic pollution. And this has always been a concern to me. But I became interested in microplastics um, already in my undergrad when a friend of me mentioned, mentioned it, that her research, that when, sorry, and when she was researching sponges from a local bay here, that she found they were full of glitter. And that was very scary for me. And I became very interested in studying microplastics after that. So I did my undergrad thesis on that and also also doing my master's degree about microplastics, but now I'm studying microplastics in freshwater and how freshwater animals ingest them and what are the effects of it. So to begin this presentation, I will ask you that this is a very interactive talk. So if you feel comfortable, you can interact with me and Lydia in the chat box and we will be very happy if you do so. So, first of all, I'm showing you all these pictures that you can see in my slide. And maybe you can take a quick look and answer me, what do you think that these pictures have in common? And write your answers in the chat box if you want to. So here you have like a refrigerator, you have clothes, toys, electronics, a chair, um, candy, what do you think they have? And I'm seeing some answers here in the chat. And many people were saying that they all contain plastic, microplastics, plastics or synthetic fibers, but they're all colorful things. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So let's see. Yeah, as many of you mentioned, they all have plastics, even though they don't exactly look like they have, for example, in the clothes or in the cell phone, they all do have plastics in them. But what exactly is plastic? What is plastic made of? So the majority of plastics we have, they're made from after extracting petroleum, natural gas and crude oil. And after that, we, they go into heavy machinery and after a lot of chemical process, heating process, they became the chemicals that we know as polypropylene or polyethylene, for example. And then they can become the plastics that we know. They might be colorful, huge or small, and that, that are all around us. So when I was making this presentation, I took a quick look around me and I noted these six things that all have plastic and they were just by my side. So my pen, my lip balm, my mouth, and also my mouse pad that's made of synthetic fibers, my laptop, this old toy, and even this plastic cup full with pens and pencils. So maybe can you, can you see if you can touch some plastic too? right where you are watching this presentation. And if you can, please write your answers in the chat box so I can know where you touch.
So someone said cell phone, mouse, water bottle, other water bottle, a blanket, clothes, the table, even the glasses, a calculator, synthetic fibers in the clothes, food container, clock. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of plastic, right? And people are actually seeing that plastic like everywhere now. Yeah, plastic's everywhere and it's right also right there with us. So yeah, let's see. When did the production of plastic started and how did it develop? So it actually started in the beginner of the last century and it became more popular during World War II when all the other materials were being heavily used. All the metals, rubber, uh, even wood, everything was being extremely used and they needed something else to use too. So plastic became more popular by them. And even the aircraft in the helmets of the military, parachutes, even guns. And interestingly, by then, every person in the military even won uh, black plastic couple in their hygiene kit. Plastic became also the thing that everyone could carry and would have right in their pockets if they wanted to. So after World War II finished and plastics was already being made and created and when the war finished, they didn't have much use for it anymore they decided that the plastic should become a popular daily thing. So they started making it into furniture, as you can see, the red table and chairs right there, even in toys, for example, Barbie dolls, and silverware that we use until now. It became like very huge lots of propaganda by them. And people are even saying that they could like throw their lives away and that it would be much simple because you wouldn't need to wash your dishes anymore. You could just use a plastic plate or a plastic cup and just throw away. It would be so much simple, the life after the war. So because of all these features that Natasha has mentioned, like the durability, the versatility, and the inexpensiveness of plastic, um, in the last 60 years, we've gone from pictures like this one on the left um, that says everything's best in cellophane and basically everywhere you looked, they were trying to sell plastic and use plastic um, to now where we have mountains of plastic that we don't know what to do with anymore. So we have another activity for you to answer in the chat box. Um, what do all five of these pictures have in common? So an uninhabited island, a beautiful lake, wild animals, big cities, and the middle of the ocean. So I'll give everyone a minute to answer in the chat. Um, and I don't seem to be seeing the answers. So Natasha, do you mind maybe just reading some of them out? Sure, no problem. I will read them as they pop up. I got some too. Uh, they need water, air, plastic, air. Oh, okay, you. that's great. So one of those was what I was going for. And that is they are all places that contain plastic. So each one of these five locations is somewhere where you find plastic and microplastic. Thank you, Lydia. So now I will just ask you to look at this huge blue whale and see how big it is right next to that scuba diver and imagine how heavy it is also. It is actually the heaviest animal alive and it is worth 180 tons. So it is pretty huge and pretty heavy, right? But when we compare it to plastic production, we can now produce over 400 million tons of plastic every year. And we not only can produce it, but we are producing. Well, that is a lot. 
And if you think about the blue scale, the blue whale that I showed you before, you see that it is over 2 million blue whales of plastic that we are producing every year now. And if you take all the plastic that we have ever produced since the 19th, we will see that we have produced like more than eight, 9 billion tons until now. And if you can still compare with the blue whale, that would be over 2 million blue whales of plastic. Definitely a lot. And only 30% of all this plastic is still in use. While the biggest part of it, 55% of all this plastic is in landfills and in the environment, marine, fresh water. And 90% was incinerated. So probably releasing lots of toxic chemicals in there, increasing the pollution of it. And only 6% of all those plastics that I showed you was recycled. So that's a very low percentage of plastic being effectively recycled and reused. And all this plastic, it takes over 500 years, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the composition of it, to totally degrade. It's a long time here in the Earth. And if you think about it, all the plastic that we have ever created is still here because we have only been producing it for around 100 years by now. So that is a lot of plastic, not all of, a lot of plastic to manage. And some estimations have shown that every second, this amount of plastic that you can see in my screen, what is a lot to have like, plastic bottles, plastic bags, fishing nets, every second, all this plastic goes into our oceans, rivers, and ecosystems. So scientists are predicting that by the year 2050, the weight of marine plastic will exceed the weight of marine fish. So this is pretty scary and pretty close in the future. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. So now that we know a little bit about plastics, we can talk about microplastics. So microplastics are tiny pieces of plastic less than five millimeters in size. Uh, microplastics can be further broken down into two categories. So the first category of microplastic is called primary microplastic. And this is plastic that is intentionally produced to be tiny. So this can be nurdles, which you see directly below. And these are um, from factories and plastic production. They're colored and then sent off to be melted down and made into all the different plastic items that we have around us. There's also primary microplastics known as microbeads. Um, and these are often found in face wash or toothpaste. And then finally up at the top there, we have glitter. So just how tiny is one nurdle? So this photo here is a handful of tiny nurdles from the shores of Lake Superior. And as you can see, this is one single nurdle on my hand, just so you can see how tiny they are. Uh, so we have another activity. These are some photos I took this summer while camping on Lake Superior. And um, there are a couple nurdles in th these two photos, so if you think you can count how many, write it in the chat box and we'll see if anyone gets it right. Someone said oh. zero, someone said two, someone said four, someone said, a couple of people said four, someone said nine, someone said seven, someone says it looks like sand, <laughs> um, someone else said three in each. Um, so I will reveal that there are four tiny nurdles, um, along the shoreline here. So only a few of you got it correct, but that's okay. So as I said, there are two ways to, um, distinguish between microplastics. 
Um, so we just talked about primary microplastics and the second form of microplastics um, and the more prominent are secondary microplastics. So these are the result of plastic fragmentation. Um, so plastic can fragment in a few different ways. Um, the first are from environmental conditions um, like exposure to oxygen, also known as oxidation, or UV from the sun. Um, it can also break down and fragment from physical or mechanical forces um, like wind or waves, or maybe a car running it over on the road or a person stepping on it on the beach. Um, and the last way that you can fragment is through thermal or chemical stress, um, and that can be heat or cold. So not all microplastics are made the same and they can come from a variety of different um, objects. So here are just a few examples of different ways that microplastics can break down. So the first is from clothing and that produces fibers. Um, the second is from plastic bags and that can produce films. And the third is from plastic bottles and containers and that produces fragments. So how do microplastics get into our environment? Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a case study from um, Northwestern Lake Ontario because I'm currently in Kingston, um, but this is likely in a lot of areas. So microplastics getting into the environment are linked to urbanization and places that people are. So the top four ways that this study found microplastic entering Lake Ontario was firstly through wastewater from homes. So this can be through your washing machine, um, your shower, toilet, or your sink. The second is storm water runoff. So um, all the sewage grates you see on the road, those lead right into um, bodies of water. So litter, or car parts are two common ways that microplastics can enter through stormwater. Um, another one is agriculture. So both um, animal and um, food production, those can both be sources of microplastics. And then finally, we have factories and fishing. And a really common case that you see or hear about in the media are fishing nets breaking loose from these fishing boats. Thank you, Lydia. And now, because we have so many different kinds of plastics, different sizes, different compositions, and different forms of plastics and microplastics, this behaves differently in the water column. So once it gets to the oceans, for example, some plastics, like bottle caps made of probably propylene, like we can see in the picture right on the top of it, it might eventually float, as well as plastic bags. However, fishing nets, containers, sometimes cigarette filters, they might get in the middle of the water column, just swimming around. And if it's a heavier plastic, like a soft drink bottle that will eventually be full of water, it might sink from the water column directly to the bottom of it, and even might get trapped in the sediment. So all the plastics behave differently. And because this happens, it is also a huge source of microplastics interaction and plastics interaction with different wildlife. So as you can see in the picture, this is like a seabird and it ate a lot of plastic. And what might happen and probably happened to this bird that we see and to other marine fish or other animals is that they ingest plastic and they feel like they are already fulfilled. They don't they, they they don't need food anymore. But what they have inside of them is plastic. So they don't get the proper energy of it. And maybe they can grow, they can reproduce and end up not having babies or Maybe they will get so full of plastic that they can't fly well or they can't swim and look for proper food or eventually they might even die. And another problem with plastics and microplastics 
this algae can also carry other toxic pollutants that are in the water. They can pretty much absorb everything around them, like heavy metals or different chemicals. And if an animal ingests them, it will also be ingesting all the pollutants and heavy metals, which also might be bad for their health. And another problem, and this is a very recent research that scientists are still looking into it, if this is actually a true effect or not, is that plastic might, might accumulate in the body of the animals. So what does that mean? That means that if an animal ingests plastic and can't take it out of their body, as the day goes on, they only have more plastics in them. And then if a bigger fish ingests a smaller fish who had already ingested microplastics, it will also be ingesting all the microplastics that it ingested. So it might be a huge problem for the whole food chain. And now I will ask you another to do an, another activity with me and just to make you think about what kind of animals might be interacting with all this plastic. So first we can start with the plastics that sinked all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So if you want, you can write your answer to the chat box of what animals do you think can interact with this plastic. So someone said crabs, and yeah, crabs might interact with them. Someone else said fish, turtles, and okay, all these animals can interact. Maybe other kinds that are stay pretty much in the ocean floor are manta rays or corals, like someone just mentioned. Yeah, and in the middle of the water column, like someone said, sea turtles might be ingesting them and all kinds of fish, mammals too. So maybe that blue whale that we saw before is also ingesting all these plastics. And the plastics that are flowing, someone just mentioned albatrosses and seabirds. Yeah, they probably uh, jump in the water to eat some fish and may mistake them by a bottle cap, for example. So yeah, pretty much every animal in the ocean can interact with all this plastic. And this is not a problem only for the ocean. This also happens in fresh water, so in lakes, rivers. And there in the picture, you can see a few animals that also are interacting with these microplastics, for example, the ducks, freshwater fish, and even the zooplankton. Daphnia might also be ingesting them. And something that you might be asking yourself is, okay, so we have all these microplastics in the water, but can we remove them? What do we do now? And unfortunately, the answer to this question is not a very good one because microplastics are very small and our oceans and rivers are pretty big. So that is a very hard task. But Suzuki have tried with installing some filters in their boats and this filter, the, the water goes through it and then it returns to the ocean or to the lake or whatever it's navigating on and it collects all the plastic particles so the water goes back with no plastic at all. But maybe the energy to that is a lot. So maybe it's not a very good option or effective one. What other people are doing is trying to stop them from entering the ocean by installing some filters in our wastewater home, in the wastewater, or adding a few uh, steps in the water treatment. So the first one is I need that you can see the jellyfish. It's a gold jelly initiative that uses jellyfish mucus to filter microplastics. And the other one was this teenager that developed a way of removing the microplastics in the water treatment by 
using a magnetic liquid that would attach all the microplastics on it and then extracting it with magnetic. So that's pretty cool, but everything is still being developed. So we still don't have an effective way now to remove the microplastic. And not even the macroplastics, the bigger ones, is also not an easy task. But the ocean cleanup has a really nice initiative of removing plastics from rivers and also from the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And what they are doing is installing these nets that will capture the plastic, as you can see in the picture on the right. And after the fact, the plastic is captured and accumulated, they just go there with their boats and extract all this plastic. But again, it's not like so effective and it's still under development. So by now, what I can say is that the best option that we have is to prevent the plastics to go into our environment, stop it from getting there. And another question that you might be asking yourself is that if we are ingesting microplastics too. So we just saw a lot of wildlife that is ingesting them. And unfortunately, I have to say that we are also ingesting them. So scientists have found that all over uh, in different countries in the tap water that we are drinking and also in bottled beverage that we drink, we're also drinking microplastics along it. Another source of microplastic ingestion is in seafood because fish, lobster and mussels might have ingested it before when they were in the environment. When we eat them, we also eat all the microplastics. And what is it was even found in the sea salt of different brands. So this is another source of microplastics. And another one is in the air that we breathe, that because microplastics are so tiny and so light, it might get suspended in the air. And when you breathe, you are also inhaling it because of our house dust or in the city dust. And some crazy estimations have shown that in one week, you might ingest the amount of plastic that a credit card has, which is around five grams of plastic. So we might be getting it every week in our systems. But should we worry about it? So research is pretty new and we still don't have a lot of data on that, but what we have now is that we shouldn't be so much worried, but you should definitely keep an eye on that because plastics carry all the pollutants and it might be getting in our bodies too, or if it accumulates in us. So we definitely need to keep an eye. And this very recent research showed that actually last month, uh, some microplastics were found in human placenta. So that was fairly crazy for me. And some news even reported it as a high-board baby now. So yeah, we should definitely look at that more closely in the future because microplastics pollution is not going anywhere. It's gonna stuck with us for a while now, unfortunately. So now that we've given you quite a little bit to think about and some of it was a little bit negative um i thought that i would add a few positives um, that have happened in canada and that are happening in canada so what is canada doing to help so the first thing is the canada single-use plastic ban um, and this plan has been sort of in the works for the last few years and will be in full effect uh, by the end of this year um, unfortunately, it doesn't cover all single use plastics, but it is a start um, and some of the plastics that are included in this ban will be plastic grocery bags, um, straws, stir sticks, six pack rings for beer or pop, um, cutlery and foodware made from hard to recycle plastics. Another exciting initiative that officially launched yesterday. Um, is called the Canada Plastics Pact. Um, and this has over 40 partners from all different sectors. 
Um, and the Canada Plastics Pact um, has three main goals. So the first is to eliminate unnecessary or problematic plastic packaging. The second is to innovate so that the plastic we do need to use can be either safely reused, recycled, or composted. Um, and finally, they want to create a circular, circular market, pardon me, um, so that all of the plastic items that we do use are kept in our economy and not into the environment. Um, so I just included a few of the 40 partners. Um, so brands you may be familiar with like Canadian Tire, Coca-Cola Canada, Loblaws, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and OceanWise. So now, what can you do to help? The first thing that you can do, and one of the most important things that you can do, is to refuse plastic. So whenever you can, say no to single-use plastics. Um, things like bringing reusable bags to the grocery store or a reusable mug to the coffee shop. Um, even uh, reusable cutlery when you're ordering takeout. The second thing you can do is reuse. So if you must use plastic, um, try to reuse it as many times as you can. So old Tupperware, um, old sour cream containers, uh, like I mentioned, reusable bags, um, in COVID, reusable masks. Something that I try to do is um, wash and reuse plastic sandwich or freezer bags, um, as well as reusing old peanut butter containers for leftovers or for bulk items. Another thing you can do is reduce. So where you can reduce your consumption of plastic products. Um, so next time you're at the grocery store, ask yourself, can this product be bought in glass or in cardboard? Um, and if it's accessible to you, um, you can try to invest in products like bamboo toothbrushes, cloth diapers, um, shampoo bars or bar soap, um, reusable menstrual items, reusable razors, um, and a little bit more of an investment are uh, these washing machine filters, which filter out the microplastics every time you wash your clothes. Um, something that I like to do to help reduce um, is go secondhand shopping. Uh, so you can do this for clothing, toys, or household supplies. Um, it's a really great way to minimize your impact. So finally, you can repurpose your plastic. And a really common trend I found was to um, reuse them to plant plants for the summer or paint them and make little um, household plant pots. Um, and then finally, the last step after you've done all four of the steps that I previously mentioned is to recycle. Um, and it's really important to remember that recycling is not the solution for plastics. So I've included a few other ways that you can help. Um, one way is to participate in a beach cleanup wherever you live, or even when you're just out for a walk and you notice plastic, um, pick up the litter. Um, and then finally, spread the word. So after this talk tonight, share what you learned with your friends and family and keep learning. Um, you can use tools like YouTube, there's lots of great documentaries on Netflix, um, and even just Googling and finding websites. This is a fun YouTube video called The Nerdle's Quest for Ocean Domination. Um, I won't show it now, but if you're interested after this talk. So just to wrap up, um, you can take the OceanWise 30 Day Plastic Free Family Challenge. Um, basically, you just challenge yourself to do as many of these um, tasks to try to limit your plastic consumption. Um, and you can also look on this website called Punch Plastic, where they have a lot of really interesting articles and resources if you're trying to learn how to um, make some change. Um, and then I'd just like to end by saying it's not about being perfect, but it's about doing what you can to help. So. Limiting or reducing your plastic waste doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can just be one plastic at a time. So thank you. Um, and now we'll open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, uh, we encourage you to put it in the chat box and then um, our wonderful presenters can answer those questions. Um, I've also put the links that 
um, Lydia was just talking about in the chat box. So if you want to check those out in the future, make sure that you click on them now because you won't be able to access that once the talk is over. Um, so click on those and they'll open um, in another spot. And then there's also a document that has some microplastic challenge information. If anyone, oh, great. So we have a question, Lydia and Natasha from Fred Schuler. It says, what kind of research on microplastics is done at Queen's? Natasha, do you want to maybe start since your project is on microplastics? Yeah, sure. So my exactly project is aims to investigate how microplastic um, in freshwater animals ends up in the food web. So if it is actually bioaccumulating in freshwater animals or not, if it is higher in sub predators, or if it is higher in animals that filter, what exactly is happening with microplastic pollution in freshwater ecosystems. But there are other research also in also in our lab. And Lydia can also talk a little bit about her research. Yeah, thanks, Natasha. Yeah, I will mention, I know there are um, a couple other labs that are studying microplastics. I don't know as much about the details that I do for our lab, but I do know um, there are students studying microplastics on um, amphibians, as well as like checking for microplastics in polar bear scat. Um, and our supervisor, Diane, is part of a very large project that's starting this summer at the IISD Experimental Lakes area, where researchers from like all over the world are going to be studying microplastics, freshwater, various um, parts of ecosystem. So fish, zooplankton, all of these kinds of things. Um, my project is hoping to bridge knowledge systems, so bridge Indigenous knowledge and Western science to study microplastics in freshwater lakes. So those are just some, but there's definitely more out there is doing. Okay, I have another question from Kelly. How long do you think it'll take to ban disposable masks as they're a huge factor in plastic pollution right now? I can, I can try to answer that. I just actually read something today talking about COVID and PPE and how there are people currently working on trying to find ways to make um, reusable PPE and PPE that can be like composted. But yeah, I don't know if banning, banning single-use masks in like the healthcare field will ever happen. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't think I know enough to like make an educated guess you for that. Thank you. Okay, another question. It's uh, from Michael. It says, this is an amazing presentation. We like to use metal water bottles as one of the ways to do our part to reduce our use of plastics. Any other top tips for plastic reduction aside from what you've mentioned? Natasha, do you want to take this one or do you want me to take it? Um, if you remember, Sarah, if you remember something else, maybe you can just go ahead. I don't think I have anything right now. Uh, yeah, I guess other than like what I mentioned, what I mentioned were definitely like the big ones that I would say to, to anyone. Um, I think reducing is like, and refusing are like the two biggest things that you can do. I think another thing is to try not to, not to get like sucked into like the gimmicky um products that are out there and trying to like find ways to just use what you have because buying a bunch more things isn't always the better uh the better option either okay um another question do microplastics eventually break further break down into less harmful forms okay i can take this one so actually microplastics, they will eventually become even smaller and smaller 
And we also have another spectrum size that we call nanoplastics. And we don't have a lot of studies on that because it is so small that it's very hard to do research with it. But I won't say that it is less harmful and maybe it's probably even more harmful because it's so small that it might eventually, for example, go inside a cell or our bloodstream, for example, and might even get more harmful. But eventually it will be like so small that it can become like a molecule or something and maybe then it won't be harmful. Okay, um, another question. Do facial products that use microplastics usually list that in the ingredients? Um, I don't know the, the actual answer to that. I know like on the front of them, sometimes they'll say like with exfoliating microbeads or like something like something like along the lines of that. I don't know specifically if it would say it on the label. Um, I don't know if Natasha has an answer. Yeah, I can add something to that because I was doing some research at my home and trying to figure out if what I had had microplastics. And it was harder than I imagined because they have to put it in the ingredients. So sometimes you see like polyethylene or polypropylene, but then there are other forms of plastics that can be used in facial products. So I actually had to come up with a list of types of microplastics in the internet. And they have like maybe 15 or 20 ways to say that they contain plastic. Um, even maybe to mask that they have it on. I don't know for sure, but it was a hard task to know, but they have to put it in the ingredients. So if you can find out the list or even just look for the most popular ones that are polyethylene and poly polypropylene, polyesterine, maybe you can see it there. Thank you. I have thought that before too. So that's a great question. Um, are there any forms of plastic that generally cannot be recycled? Um, I can take a stab at this one. I know depending on where you live, um, my plastics, certain plastics aren't recyclable. For example, um, I'm from Thunder Bay um, and we only accept like two different types of plastic and the rest has to go into the trash. Like, so for an example, um, the like packs that strawberries come in, we have to throw those in the garbage. So, um, Depending on where you are, um, no, they can't be recycled. And oftentimes it gets used like once more and then it can't be used again. So that's why we made that little note that said recycling is not the answer because it's almost like a way to, to mask the fact that it eventually will just end up um, in the trash. Um, I don't know if Natasha wants to add to that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just maybe wanted to add that even if a plastic is re recycled like one time, it probably won't be really recycled. So it will eventually go to the uh, landfills or even the environment. The recyclable rates are very limited. And yeah, then, but even new ones, like just the most popular they have like actually machines and industries that will recycle them. Excellent. Uh, another question, what about the use of bacteria which are able to digest the plastic? How far is Canada in that type of research? I can go to. I don't know exactly about Canada, but bacteria research 
it's not like it's very recent too. So they have found things like um, four or five species that I know that can digest. But the problem is that this, because the research is so new that they can only digest like one kind of plastic. And the most recent study that I was seeing actually reported that this bacteria could eat, um, I don't even remember the name of the plastic, but it wasn't very popular. So maybe it's not the solution to, but hopefully we'll have more research on that and find out more different kinds of bacteria. They even found like one caterpillar that can eat plastic too, which I found was very nice. And yeah, but research is still new and not like effective to actually combat pollution right now. And we have another question that goes along the same lines. It says, I remember hearing about pettase, the enzyme that eats plastic. Has it been used on a large scale yet or is it still in the early phases? I think that's still in the early phases too. Just like the bacteria and the caterpillar. I think none of that has been used on a large scale yet. But hopefully it will change in the future. Caroline had a comment. It says that there's a phone app called Think Dirty and you can scan or search your beauty products and it will tell you the harmful chemicals in the products. But she's not sure if it would say plastics, but that would be something neat to check into more. I'll just make a comment. That's a really cool app and I've used it before. But yeah, I would have to look and see if they include plastics. I know there is one specifically for plastics too, but I can't remember the name right now because when I was using it here in Brazil, it didn't have like the Brazilian brands. So I kind of deleted and I don't remember the name, but it's something like, yeah, just put on Google and it probably show up microplastics and beauty products and apps, maybe it will show up. Excellent, there's been some um, links that have been shared and then there's one more comment. Um, it says, Stephen Mander said, I don't have a mic on my computer, so he typed it. He says, I used to do research on plastic degradation at the DuPont Research Center years ago. I did the lab work. The big job was to prevent degradation not easy. All plastics decompose in UV light. PVC is quite stable. Polyethylene and polypropylene are not. If the plastic gets old and begins to degrade, it goes quite fast as it unpolymerizes and reverts to its original raw ingredients and finally oxidizes to CO2. My concern about degraded plastics was very low. It was similar to paraffin waxes and such. So interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Stephen. Um, Fred Schuler asked, Did, didn't Canada ban the microplastic beads in beauty products a year or so ago? I do think I remember hearing something about that. I thought it was maybe the states that did it. Um, I could do a quick little check on that though, but I know that it was becoming apparent that that was like a big source. Um, it was found a lot in like Bath and Body Works, um, um, hand sanitizers and all of that. So yeah, I think that micro beads, beads specifically in beauty products have like more recently come on the radar and they're um, working to try to get those out of everything. Yeah, I remember hearing that too. I wasn't sure on the timeline of it, but I remember that as well. Someone else asked, does microwaving food in plastic containers lead to microplastics in your food? Great question.
I I don't know that. I'm so sorry. I don't know if Natasha could be more help here. Um, yeah, someone just messaged and said, non-microwave safe containers. So unless it says microwave safe, there probably is some risk of microplastics. Similarly to like, if you use a plastic water bottle too many times, there may be a risk there too. Excellent. Thank you so much. If there's any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I'm going to put another poll up. Uh, just, I'd love to get people's feedback now at the end. Um, so I'm going to do that. And if you think of anything else you want to ask, you can do that at this time too. Thank you, everyone. All right. So I'm so glad that everyone loved the event. That's great. And that you, you're going to attend more. Um, Lindsay and Sabrina are going to mention the other events that are coming up. Um, and I'm really glad that people feel that they learned something and that it was easy to access overall. That's, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing this with, with us. I'd love to get your feedback. You can go ahead, Lindsay. All right, so thank you to everyone who came out tonight and thank you so much, um, Lydia and Natasha for um, taking time out of your day to share your knowledge with us. Um, we really appreciate it, so thanks again. And for everyone in the audience, we just wanted to um, let you know that we are going to be having events um, every month. And so our next event will be on Polar Bears with Kristen Hayward on February 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so the same time as this event. And then we will have one in March, but stay tuned on that one. And then we will have another one on pollinators on April 22nd, which is Earth Day. And so you can find out all the details about these events um, on Elbow Lake social media. And our website is elbowlakecenter.ca. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And our username is Elbow Lake EEC. Thanks. Thanks everyone so much. And we're gonna put this recording on our YouTube channel as well. So if you wanted to share it with anyone else, it will be available there. <laughs>